Um, and thank you for inviting me. Yeah, so I'm uh, Mihaela. I'm a research associate uh, at the University of uh, Glasgow in the SOFMEC uh, Center, so soft tissue mechanics of the heart. Um, and yeah, today my, my talk is on emulation and of course GP emulation in uh, cardiovascular modeling. And sorry, I forgot to say that actually this is, uh, uh, so I will be focusing on uh, two projects and these um, have been joint work with colleagues from um, Glasgow, from the Department of Engineering, Sean McGinty and Andre Smith, um, as well as collaborators from the, uh, from the US, from South, South and North Carolina State University. Uh, Mitchell Kolbank and uh, my line manager Dirk Husmeyer from, from Glasgow. <coughs> so just a quick overview of uh, applications. Um, so the, the first uh, one, um, we have been putting a lot of effort into inferring parameters in a physical model of the pulmonary blood circulation. Um, and this is inference includes estimation, uncertainty quantification, um, getting model mismatch, incorporating it uh, into the analysis, and so on. Um, and for the second uh, uh, project uh, that is on medical device optimization, um, so that is just the optimization of drug delivery from drug eluting stents. Um, and this is for coronary uh, artery diseases. Um, so both, you know, with both projects, uh, we are aiming towards clinical translation. Um, and, you know, we, we aim to improve healthcare, uh, patient care. Um, and, um, you know, we, we have um, mathematical models um, that we use to simulate things. And, you know, the, the problem usually is, or at least one of the problems is that these mathematical models are computationally expensive to evaluate. And so if we want to get the mathematical modeling and statistical inference into the clinic, um, then we need fast surrogate models. And in my work, I have used Gaussian processes to construct these emulators. Um, so with each individual uh, project, um, we are aiming to improve um, the diagnosis process for different diseases. So for the first project, that is pulmonary hypertension. Uh, and for the second project, is coronary uh, artery diseases. Uh, to improve the diagnosis process and the treatment subsequently as well. Okay, so the first uh, application on pulmonary hypertension. So what is actually pulmonary hypertension and why do we care about it in the first place? Um, so in pulmonary hypertension, um, the blood pressure increases. Uh, and that is the uh, blood pressure in the pulmonary arteries. And the arteries um, become stiff and thick. So for instance, uh, here uh, I'm contrasting a healthy heart and the arteries, pulmonary artery in the healthy heart to that um, of a, a patient suffering from pulmonary hypertension. So you can see here in pulmonary hypertension, the um, arteries are narrow uh, and um, stiff. Uh, and so the, um, in order for the blood uh, to flow, there is more resistance and so the pressure increases, um, the, the blood pressure. And if pulmonary hypertension is left untreated, um, it can have serious, uh, even life-threatening um, um, consequences for, for the patient. So that includes right heart uh, damage and even uh, heart failure. However, in order to uh, treat it, we first need to diagnose it. 
Um, and uh, the, currently the only way and state of the art way that pulmonary hypertension is diagnosed is uh, invasively uh, for the patients. Um, so the, um, I'm, I'm, sh I'm showing here in, in this figure. So that is done with right heart catheterization and the catheter is inserted in a vein here around the neck and it goes all the way down to the lungs, to the pulmonary artery where uh, the blood pressure is uh, measured. Um, and obviously this is you know, an invasive procedure so it comes with um, consequences uh, for the patient. So that, that can include e excessive bleeding and even uh, partial lung collapse. And so one of uh, the aims of this uh, project is to develop a non-invasive alternative uh, for the patients. So rather than rely on an invasive uh, measurement of blood pressure, um, ideally we want to rely on flow, blood flow, which can be measured uh, non-invasively for the patients with uh, MRI. So what we have is, and I'm not showing in this slide, but we have um, hemodynamic data that is uh, blood flow or pr pressure from the patients. Then we have imaging data uh, that is a CT scan of the pulmonary vessel network. We combine these data modalities with mathematical modeling. The, the mathematical model um, just uh, simulates uh, blood hemodynamics in the pulmonary arteries. And uh, then we uh, add statistical inference uh, to this because the mathematical model depends on some unknown parameters um, that can't be measured uh, directly for the patients. And so we need to learn these parameters indirectly from measured data measure data be blood flow or, page, or pressure. Um, so an example of a model parameter um, is the vessel stiffness uh, because in, and this is a, a great um, indicator, bioindicator of disease because in pulmonary hypertension patients, um, the stiffness increases. Uh, so knowing this, um, will, will be um, beneficial when uh, trying to diagnose uh, or treat the disease. So what we have is we have these model parameters. We have uh, the mathematical model, which for the purpose of this talk, I will just consider to be a black box. Um, um, and we insert these parameters into parameter values in the mathematical model. And uh, what we get from the mathematical uh, model um, is some output, uh, for instance, blood pressure or blood flow. Uh, here I'm showing the blood pressure. So there are uh, two curves here. The, um, uh, yeah, the, the output from the mathematical model or the simulator is in a dashed uh, green line. So the, the output is just a time series. And then I mentioned we have um, data measured uh, experimentally uh, in the case of pressure with right heart catheterization. And that is what I'm showing here in um, continuous black line. Uh, also a time series. And um, so one of the aims of the project has been to find um, the parameter values that uh, generate um, an output, a model output, simulator output, that is as close to the measurements as possible. Um, and so in a sense, this can be an optimization uh, problem or Bayesian, what, however you want to formulate it, um, in which you uh, minimize the Euclidean distance uh, between the time series, two time series. Uh, any questions so far? Okay. Um, 
so I mentioned um, earlier that um, we have this uh, mathematical model, but it is computationally expensive to run, or at least too computationally uh, expensive to get it into the clinic, where decisions need, to, for instance, if it is, you know, you go to A&E and the decision needs to be made within minutes or, uh, uh, you know, running a computationally expensive model numerous times as part of an optimization is obviously not feasible. Um, so I have built emulators um, for, for the model output. Um, and here I will, I mean, as part of this work, uh, actually we have used two types of emulators. The first one is Gaussian processes, which I will uh, mainly be focusing on. Um, but we have also, we were um, interested in comparing how Gaussian process uh, emulators compare to other types of emulators, such as, for instance, polynomial chaos um, emulators. And, um, and I will only briefly touch on polynomial chaos. Um, yeah, so within uh, Gaussian processes, um, essentially, I have built the, uh, the emulator uh, in two different ways. Uh, the first one is I have built, uh, so I've done a multi-output GP for the entire time series. Um, in this way, capturing correlations between time points. And um, the uh, second way was to do a PCA uh, dimensionality reduction and um, in that case, I built my emulators on the principal component uh, coefficients. And I will be comparing these two types of um, emulation strategies. Um, and we kind of, you know, vary the different settings uh, within the emulator. So uh, one was um, the training data size. Uh, we wanted to see um, if we use 100 training points or if we use, for instance, 1,000, how much more do we gain with 1,000 training points? Um, or we also played around with other settings such as the kernel type. We wanted to investigate if, you know, choosing a squared exponential or a matern or neural network, whatever it is, does it really make a difference? Um, to the predictions, uh, prediction accuracy and inference accuracy or not. Um, and we evaluated performance on the forward uh, problem. Uh, that is, how well can my emulator predict the actual signals, as well as on the inverse problem. So uh, once I constructed my emulator, if I now uh, run a, an inference scheme, how well can my emulator um, estimate the, the parameters <coughs> of interest. So, um, yeah, so output uh, representation, as mentioned earlier, I uh, constructed the emulator first for the um, entire, uh, for the entire uh, time series, and uh, second, I constructed the, the emulator for uh, PCA reduced uh, space. So now, okay. Um, so now taking them uh, one by one for PCA reduced um, space. I'm uh, okay. Um, so um, the f of theta here is just the simulator output at the unknown parameters uh, uh, theta. So th this is essentially the time series. Uh, so we do um, PCA um, and, okay. um, and uh, we will be, um, so we go from the time series has 512, just over 500 uh, time points. Um, and with uh, PCA, I ended up using um, five principal components. Um, so we now have a 5D space. And um, so this Q here is five. And so I have fitted independent Gaussian process emulators for each uh, PC uh, coefficient uh, C here. So 
the uh, input uh, is the, the parameter theta of interest, um, and I fit a, and I uh, put a Gaussian process on the on each uh, PC score. Okay, and for the time approach, um, what we have done, uh, so we have um, expanded the, um, the input space. Um, so before we had theta as the input, um, and we have a time series. So rather than uh, fit a, a multi-output GP to the entire uh, time series, what we did was we added each individual uh, time point um, as, a, as an input uh, to the GP. So now the GP takes a theta, the parameters, and time as an additional uh, input. Um, and so the output corresponding to that is univariate. Now, for each individual time point, we have one blood pressure or blood flow point. Um, <clears throat> and on this univariate output, then I uh, placed a Gaussian process. And um, yeah, so I have, for the kernel, um, I assumed separability in kernels between inputs theta and uh, time, so the joint kernel um, is the product of individual uh, kernels. And this takes you to, um, to represent the full covariance uh, matrix as a Kronecker uh, product uh, between two smaller matrices. And um, doing this um, is uh, very beneficial from a um, computational point of view because the original um, uh, matrix here was, so if we have n thetas and m time points would have been n m by n m. And well, inverting that wouldn't be uh, so easy. So by having this uh, Kronecker product, then we can make use of special uh, properties of the Kronecker product, such as for instance, when we, so for example, when we invert um, this uh, covariance matrix, the inverse of this uh, it's just the Kronecker product of the inverse of each uh, individual smaller uh, matrix. And this is one example of a property that you uh, can use. Okay, so before I move on, are there uh, any questions? Okay, um, so um, now, very briefly, uh, so I've spoken about, ga uh, about Gaussian processes, um, and uh, I mentioned earlier that we used polynomial chaos expansions as well as, um, as an alternative emulator, and there are, you know, many different types of emulators uh, you can use. Um, here we, well, our choice was polynomial chaos expansion, or PCE, uh, shorter. So, um, uh, what are PCE? So, PCE emulators live in a, a polynomial uh, function space, um, and they they take the simulator output uh, f of uh, theta, the time series, um, and they uh, do some uh, finite uh, truncation to express it now. Um, in terms of uh, polynomials. Um, so here, um, gamma or, anyway, this is not gamma, I'm not sure what it's called. What's that? Psi. Um, yeah, uh, this one uh, here is uh, our multivariate uh, polynomials uh, that uh, are, uh, are made up of, well, products of univariate. Uh, polynomials that depend on the parameters of interest uh, theta. And here Z uh, is just the polynomial uh, coefficients. Um, and we have J in total, uh, uh, a total number of uh, polynomial basis uh, expansion, and that is for polynomial order uh, K here. And so, 
um, well, I won't be focusing much on this, but basically in the same way that we varied the kernel for GPs, um, for PCEs, we looked at the effect of changing the polynomial order. Okay, so uh, similarly as for uh, GPs, we um, first fitted PCEs for the entire times. Yes? Yeah, so there are different uh, different that are available. So, for instance, the Lagander, uh, or however, there are different, and you can we. I think we ended up using the Lagander ones, um, but there are different that you can play around with and see the effect. Yeah. For PCs. Yes, you can do that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so for the uh, time series, uh, what we did for PC, we fitted um, independent PCs for each um, output uh, time point, which uh, just boils down to um, each time point having its own uh, coefficient. Uh, here, and uh, if I am to contrast this with what we did for GPs, the multi-output in, in which we the multi-output GP in which we um, had time as an additional input besides the parameters, well, here there is uh, some um, inconsistency, uh, if you like, because with PC we don't exactly capture the correlation uh, between time points. Uh, like uh, with GPs, but this is kind of what, well, most people do and, um, you know, getting uh, or making it multivariate and getting that correlation between time points in is currently an active area of uh, research. Um, yeah. Sorry, say that again. It's an active area of research, uh, capturing, so having a PC that captures correlation between time points. Yeah. Okay, and for the second approach with PCA, we did essentially what we did with uh, Gaussian processes. Uh, we fitted a PCE emulator um, to each, uh, an independent PC emulator to each, um, uh, PC coefficient. <coughs> um, and this is the workflow uh, uh, you uh, saw before. So now I will um, just focus on showing results first for the forward problem and then for the um, inverse problem. So for the forward pro problem to see how well the emulator um, actually predicts the time series. Uh, what we did was first we investigated the effect of the of changing the GP kernel and the PC polynomial order, and actually um, I also looked at uh, changing uh, or seeing the effect of changing the jitter uh, for the GP, but I will not um, cover it here. Basically, it wasn't much of a difference, and I looked at the discrete. Um, discrete values for the jitter. So I didn't see huge difference there um, between jitters. And uh, then also, as I mentioned, I considered 100 and 1,000 uh, training points, so um, uh, parameters, thetas, um, to, to train the emulator. Um, and uh, second item of interest was, um, can the time approach, uh, so GP time or PCE time, can it do better than uh, when we reduce the dimensionality with PCA um, or not? Um, and uh, the third item of interest uh, was comparing uh, the two types of emulators, so PCE versus GP. And 
uh, to do all of this, so I, uh, you know, I had a training set that I fitted the, the emulators, the same one for PC and GPs, and then I had um, a testing uh, data set, uh, which I call theta test here, um, and I uh, put these um, theta tests in the emulators, I got the prediction, the predicted time series from them, and then I compared to this predicted time series against the uh, actual data uh, YI, the test, um, test data, test time series. Okay, and uh, these are the uh, results on the forward problem. Uh, so, First row here um, is just for GPs. Uh, this is GP time approach and GP PCA approach. And on the second row, it is for PCE uh, emulators. Um, so if we just focus on GP PCA for now, um, it's, I think, maybe a bit easier to read. So the, the first uh, two uh, box plots which showed uh, those errors between the data and my prediction. Uh, so the first two box plots are for uh, the squirt exponential kernel. Uh, next two box plots are for matern 5.2. So this is the kernel that I use for the input parameters theta um, and so on. And uh, the white box plots here are when I used 100 training points and a gray shaded a thousand uh, training points. Um, so, well, um, these are box plots of errors. So we want the box plots to be as low as possible, essentially. Um, and so one thing we notice is, well, about the, the effect of the kernel, uh, it doesn't look like, I mean, the, the, the box plots um, there is a lot of overlap between them. And so the kernel doesn't seem to, at least the kernels we have tried, um, don't seem to influence, like to produce a very different results. Um, but we do notice when we use a larger number of training points, uh, so the errors are um, systematically lower than when we use a higher number, uh, sorry, um, no, when we use a higher number of training points, the errors are systematically lower than when we use a higher number of uh, training points. And uh, now if we focus on the GP time approach, I mean, it's in terms of kernel effect and training size effect is the same conclusions that we drew. Um, and by the way here, uh, so why do I have two here? The first one, for, for example, so my term 5.2 is for the parameters, theta, and the second entry is for the time input. So here it would be my term 5.2 for the parameters and the periodic kernel for the time uh, input. Um, yeah, and uh, I guess the uh, next question of interest is comparing GP time against GP PCA um, to see, you know, when we do dimensionality reduction, um, does it decrease uh, per, uh, accuracy or not? And uh, actually, we we found that the results are comparable um, between the uh, two approaches, and we think this uh, might be because, well. In a sense, both uh, approaches, both time and PCA, they have some form of approximation. PCA uh, just reduces uh, the space, um, but the time approach also has that, um, so simplification, as, uh, assuming uh, separability in the kernels. Uh, so it's just, yeah, just different approximations in a sense. Um, and that can play a role. Um, yeah, and uh, now focusing on the second row for uh, PCE, um, I mean, it's, uh, you know, in terms of uh, uh, the polynomial 
order, at least for you know, a, a thousand training points, as we increase the polynomial order, then the accuracy increases. And uh, that is to be expected. That is, however, not the case when we use fewer training points, 100. We see a, well, weird pattern in a sense, but that is simply because with polynomial order six, we have um, many parameters, many coefficients, and little data. Uh, so it's, the system is not well determined. Um, yeah, but again, time approach similar to PCA approach. Um, and now what is more of interest comparing GPs, so comparing the different types of em emulators, GPs, or, uh, and the PCEs. And so what we found, and well, I'm trying to show this by drawing horizontal lines that are reference uh, lines. So this is reference line from the GP. So the box plots for PCE lie above these uh, horizontal lines, which means that their error is higher. Um, so generally, the GPs performed a bit better, consistently better, but not much more than um, the PCEs. So that was a finding, and this, this finding was also on another mathematical model we tried. So there was consistency in the result. Um, and yeah, the best methods were the GPs with the larger training size. Yeah? Say, say that again? It's quite similar. It's quite similar. I mean, once you train, because we used, you know, the same training set for both. So once you train them both, they're similar. Yeah. Uh, how do you fit the coefficients? How do you fit the coefficients? You know, this is, uh, uh, so PC is um, something that my collaborator actually did. Um, I, I did the GP part. I'm, I'm not sure exactly of the details. I do know that he used uh, some um, package in MATLAB called UQLab. Um, he just inputted the training size. He chose, for instance, uh, Lagender polynomials, um, the polynomial order. Um, and yeah, so you also need to choose in PC, you, you need to choose the priors, right, for the parameters. Um, so he chose priors on the parameters as well, and I think he got the results. I'm not very sure about the details. And how, do you, how do you choose the priors for Ah, yeah, so that, uh, that, that will depend on what uh, polynomial class or, uh, you use. So that can be Lagender or whatever it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. <coughs> okay. Mm. So now for the um, inverse problem, um, what we did was, well, here we did something um, simple. So we wanted to um, isolate uh, the emulation errors uh, from noise errors. So in order to do that, we just uh, considered, for inference data, we just uh, considered noise-free data. And that was also simulated uh, from the mathematical model. So by simulating it from the mathematical model, then uh, we make sure we don't have any model mismatch because the data comes from our model. And that was, again, just to avoid confoundedness with noise and model mismatch. Um, so the model mismatch is just the discrepancy you have. If you were to use real data, uh, then the model discrepancy would just be the mismatch you have between the, your observations from the real system and your simulator, the mathematical model. So we avoided that. Uh, and we took simulated and noise-free data for inference, and we simply did a gradient-based uh, optimization on the emulators. 
so we, um, it, the, the optimizer is just a gradient based um, standard uh, optimizer. And uh, we ran the optimizer on the emulators uh, that gave us um, optimum parameter values, uh, which I call theta hat uh, here for I think 100 test data sets. Um, then we plugged this, uh, this uh, optimum parameter value into the simulator in the mathematical model. We got the prediction from it and we compared the prediction against our data, yi in this case, and we recorded the errors. And we also, so that was error in output space and then we recorded error in input space. Um, obviously we generated the, the inference data so we know the ground truth parameter value. Um, so we compared the ground truth parameter value theta test against the optimum parameter value that we got from the optimization. And we got the error. <coughs> And uh, here, so for this plot, I'm only showing for the forward, uh, sorry, for um, uh, with the, the optim optimal kernel that we got based on the forward uh, problem. Um, and that is, um, we kind of tried to emulate what would happen in uh, real life where, you know, be before the patient comes, you fit the emulator, you get op some optimal settings and then once we have the patient data, we simply apply that uh, to, to get parameter estimates quickly. Um, and here my uh, results are, well, in a sense, um, similar to the forward uh, problem. So the best methods are the same, GP time and GPPCA with the larger uh, training size. Yeah, and uh, this is just the summary. Before I uh, move on to the second application, do you have any questions? That is, yeah, that is something we, we, want, we want to do in the future. And also, yeah, incorporating a Bayesian proper analysis with noisy data and, yeah, not simulated, yeah. I guess it, it depends how many data uh, how many data points yeah, you give yeah. it as well. Um, we never tried to go below, yeah, a hundred. We also, I mean, we only have um, a four D parameter space, so it's not. I mean, it's quite small. Yeah. Okay, so for the. Second uh, application that is um, on stents uh, that you insert in the coronary, in the blocked uh, coronary artery diseases. As I'm uh, showing here, here I'm showing a coronary artery with uh, the stent uh, inserted in. As you can see, the artery um, is um, narrow. So this can be, for instance, due to plaque formation. Um, and with the help of a balloon that is expanding, you ex expand the, the stent, you re remove the balloon, and then the stent stays in place. Um, but it's not as easy as just staying in place and that's it. So after some time, after say six months, you can get uh, restenosis. So the, the artery re-narrows 
essentially. And in order to counteract this biological response, now stents incorporate drugs. Um, and this is where uh, it becomes tricky. Uh, how much drug do we, um, do we put on the stent? We don't want the level of drug to be too high because that is toxic for the patient, uh, especially with certain drugs. And at the same time, uh, we want the drug level to be high enough in, or in order for the treatment to be successful. And so really what uh, motivated this work was to find the trade-off between safety and efficacy. And that boils down to finding some optimum stent design uh, parameters. So I have, uh, again, I have this uh, stents model that is computationally expensive to run. So we have a version of it taking almost two hours and another more realistic version taking about 24 hours. Um, obviously, you know, you can't do anything reasonable uh, with it unless you build an emulator. So that is what um, we have done. And so uh, here I'm just showing some output or quantities of interest from the model. Um, so the, this one here, drug receptor saturation, uh, is just, um, uh, this is the, uh, our measure of efficacy. Uh, and we uh, want to maximize this or in other words, maximize the area under this curve. And the second um, quantity of interest is the total drug content, and this is a measure of safety. We want to keep the maximum point here below a certain threshold. Um, and so what this uh, problem really is, it's, it's a constraint optimization uh, problem, but the um, challenge uh, is that, well, I'm showing the practical challenge in this uh, toy, 1, 1D toy uh, illustration here. Um, our optimum lies at the boundary between the domain that is safe for the patient and the domain that is toxic for the patient. And so, I spent quite a long time exploring different methods that are able to find this optimum uh, located on the boundary as accurately as possible. Um, yeah. So for this, I used uh, Bayesian optimization, and I think I can skip through this because you have seen um, already uh, what Bayesian optimization is, uh, is about. Um, and, well, in terms of acquisition functions, I played around with two, um, the um, expected improvement and the upper confidence bound. Henry, did you cover the upper confidence bound? All right, okay. So, uh, for the, yeah, so for the upper confidence, uh, for the, uh, this, uh, the upper confidence bound takes uh, this, uh, this form here. Uh, M of X is just the um, GP mean. And um, sigma of X here is the standard uh, deviation. And so you want to um, maximize the upper confidence uh, bound, uh, which just means minimizing um, the mean, which is what well, we're interested in, while at the same time encouraging um, exploration, so maximizing the um, uh, standard deviation. <clears throat> and you have seen expected improvement. Um, I mean, here, yeah, I had an illustration of Bayesian optimization, but you have seen this, so I will, I will uh, skip it. Um, yeah, so in its conventional form, Bayesian uh, optimization is unconstrained. Here, obviously, we're dealing with a constraint uh, case, in which, so we want to learn the constraint function. And what I failed to mention before is that for the constraint uh, function, I actually have, be, um, I have it returned 
uh, as a um, so as a scalar, it's a it's a real number. Um, so this allowed me to fit or to learn the constraint function either with a, a, a GP classifier or a GP regression model. If I if my constraint function only told me yes, you are in the safe domain or no, you are, uh, or you are in the critical domain, then I could have only used a GP classifier for the binary response. But because I have actual values uh, for the constraint function, then I can also use a regression model. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the GP classifier based methods, they used and we saw this earlier in the uh, earlier talk by Ruby, use the predicted probability of constraint uh, satisfaction. And uh, Ruby showed you the constraint um, method, um, the conventional one. So I will go one step further and show you um, another method, which is the asymmetric uh, entropy. Um, and, um, I will, I will also show you how you can learn the constraint function with a GP regression based uh, method um, that essentially enforces a penalty whenever you step into the um, critical or unsafe toxic uh, um, domain for the patient. And I will be um, comparing two methods for this, first augmented Lagrangian and second barrier uh, method. So, in total, I've done a comparison of nine methods on different uh, benchmark problems as well as the stents problem. So here, very briefly here, because you have, uh, okay, you have seen it before. For the constraint uh, method, you have the original acquisition function and you time it by the probability that the point uh, that your parameter satisfies the constraint. If you have multiple constraints, then you can fit um, independent uh, GP classifiers to each constraint, and then uh, you do the product of the probabilities. Now, what can be or is the problem of this approach, especially in um, the, the optimization problem I'm dealing with, the constraint optimum being exactly at the boundary. So the issue with the constraint method is that we are trying to maximize this quantity here. This is maximized when, well, this guy is maximized but also when this is maximized. This is maximized when the probability is one. The probability being one is, oh, okay. The probability being one will be well inside the safe region. However, here at the boundary, the, the probability will be lower, can even be like 0 0.5, for example. The classifier will not be sure, will not be so sure. And so the constraint method um, has a more explorative um, behavior, and that is not what we want. And so the other methods that I tried focus more on, the, on exploring at the boundary, at the constraint boundary. So one method is the asymmetric um, entropy, which takes uh, this form here. Uh, <coughs> um, it is in a sense similar to the constraint method, except um, you don't consider the probability of constraint satisfaction on its, on its own. Um, so you have this um, entropy term uh, here, this asymmetric entropy, um, which makes use of the probability of constraint. But you see, for instance here, if my probability of um, constraint being satisfied is uh, exactly one, so we are well inside the safe domain, uh, in the middle, say, then if it is one, then this SA becomes zero. And um, obviously that, uh, that is not, I mean, that will, uh, that will lower uh, the acquisition function that we are actually trying to maximize. And so this has um, 
it is essentially what we, what we want to do or to have. Um, <coughs> to encourage exploration more of the constraint boundary. Any questions so far? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, well, it takes uh, this form in order to um, help push the search more towards the constrained boundary and more away from inside the domain. So if you are inside the domain, like I showed in the middle, then you are more uh, likely to have that probability one, and so this, this term here will be zero. If this, term, uh, if this term SA here will be zero, then this term here also becomes uh, zero. And this in a sense, um, I mean, th this quantity here is maximized uh, when this one approaches one. Uh, if probability here is uh, one, then it's zero. Clearly, we don't want that. As it, become, as it gets closer to the constraint boundary, this, pro this probability here of constraint uh, satisfaction can get close to 0 0.5, for instance. Yes. Yes, yeah, yeah, um, and then, yeah, you can, you can show, and don't think, I mean, here it's also very much about exploration with, you know, different settings like here these Ws or these, uh, yeah, these W or these omegas, and this, this was, um, I mean, uh, the, the authors of the paper that invented this say they really just it was trial and error for these values as well. So it's, uh, and I did play around with different values myself, um, and at least based on my limited exploration, these values did, did produce the best results, yeah. Okay, now for the GP regression-based models. So, uh, um, so I used augmented uh, Lagrangian, um, which, well, we, we know it uh, takes this form uh, here, the, La, the Lagrangian. Um, so it's f of x here, again, it's uh, the objective function we are uh, optimizing. Um, C of x here is the constraint uh, function. So here the lambdas are the uh, La, Lagrange multipliers that um, help uh, push uh, the search towards the valid safe domain. Uh, but also whenever we step into the toxic domain, we have here this role, this plays the role of um, the penalty. So um, the method penalizes whenever we enter the toxic uh, domain and the penalty increases. And these two parameters are actually key in how the algorithm uh, works and they can be tuned to themselves though I'm not showing how to do that here. Okay, so we, can, we fit a GP regression model for our objective function, which we have done before as well, and we also fit a GP regression model for the constraint uh, function. And so doing that, we can write in composite random variable uh, form the, yeah, well, the form for the Lagrangian. And uh, then, because here we have this uh, squared term here, um, then um, we cannot get the expected improvement in closed form um, anymore. So we need to get it via simulation. So here I've done Monte Carlo uh, simulation. What I have done is I have simulated uh, draws from the GP of the um, of the objective function. Similarly, I've uh, drawn from the GP of the constraint function. I've put these draws, well, into this equation here, and uh, I got the draw for Y. So here I'm calling it YTX. And I do it, well, T times, and then I take the average. Uh, so that's how I'm computing the expected improvement uh, acquisition function. 
And then if you do some manipulation, you can get for the upper confidence bound, uh, you, can get, um, you can get it in analytical uh, form. Okay, and finally the barrier uh, method. Um, just like the Lagrangian does, so what I uh, forgot to mention is essentially the, La the Lagrangian as well as the barrier methods, they turn the, the constraint optimization problem into an unconstrained optimization problem by having this, um, well, this, the, this form here, which is now the quantity we are optimizing rather than the, uh, only the, the objective function, uh, f of x. So for the barrier method, now this is the quantity, quantity we are minimizing. And here really, I mean 10 to the minus 10, I shouldn't have uh, written that. It's just an epsilon that is a very small value, which you can take 10 to the minus 10. Um, and this, uh, so this barrier uh, kind of acts as a barrier between the um, safe and toxic domain uh, for the patient. So we minimize this, we minimize f of x, but we also have this term with the constraint. And here this max is needed in order to have a prop, I mean, a proper log term. So we don't have log of a negative uh, value. And again, we fit GPs, GP regression models to f of x, to c of x, and we get this uh, form uh, of a random variable. Uh, then what the authors of the paper where it was um, initially um, introduced, the method was initially introduced, uh, noticed, well, here in this form we don't have any, I mean, we don't, we don't have any exploration because we're only relying on the mean from the Gaussian process. We don't have any, any form of uncertainty. And so, what they did was they um, introduced uh, here this term to depend on the variance, a posterior variance from the GP. And now we have some form of exploration of the method as well. And they uh, now came up with three methods, uh, sorry, three acquisition functions. The first one is just based on the mean. Uh, so you can take the mean of this expression here and yeah, you end up with this expression. Um, so you use that as your acquisition function. Okay, well actually the negative of that, uh, you maximize it. And you can similarly derive for expected improvement and upper confidence uh, bound. Um, and um, so I took several uh, examples besides the stent uh, example that I, um, well, the first two are just some, yeah, linear examples. This is the constraint optimum, uh, the boundary. This is just from the literature. Um, it's a 2D uh, example, non-linear with multiple optima as well. Um, and the, 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 const the constraint optimum here on the boundary. Um, and well, these are just some examples um, where I considered, that I considered. And uh, I applied all of these nine methods on these um, examples and I looked at uh, the accuracy. So that is just the incumbent minimum objective function value. And I also took efficiency into consideration. I wanted to see the, besides um, seeing the method that gives um, highest accuracy, also, also the one that gives me the lowest number of points in the toxic domain. And mm -hmm. these are my uh, results. So here, uh, every row uh, ev uh, marks every method, and every column is for every application. Um, and I mean, blue is basically best, and um, uh, darkest blue, and yellow worst. Um, and here I kind of rank them based on the, well, best average across applications. Um, and what we found is that the barrier methods and the, the asymmetric entropy methods 
tended to be best as expected because they are kind of constructed to be to to explore uh, the boundary. Um, yeah, and I mean besides, you know, uh, although we found the barrier methods and uh, uh, yeah, entrop entropy methods to be best, there was no single best method across applications. So really, you need to experiment and see. Yeah, thank you. not to bluff, although I can't guarantee. So I think the, the way I set it, um, how did I set it? Uh, I definitely set it uh, depending on the parameter dimensionality. Um, and I think I took in inspiration from um, a paper on uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo that did Bayesian optimization for the hyperparameters. And it was uh, setting it, uh, hmm, yeah, I actually don't remember the details very much. Um, I just remember it depended on the parameter dimensionality and it was kind of changing. It wasn't fixed, I think. I think, I think it, uh, it was changing depending on the iteration uh, number. So to begin with, it was, just something larger um, to yeah, encourage exploration. Uh, and then as you had more and more uh, iterations, because your, Ga your, your Gaussian process was becoming more and more confident, uh, then it was in a, in a way converging towards a value. That is how I said it, yeah. Yeah. 